I'm AJ DeAndrea. On April 20th, 1999, I was part of the Jefferson County Regional SWAT team that responded here to the high school. Being in this building takes me back to that day. I was asked a little bit ago about, you know, does it seem like 20 years? And there's times it seems like forever ago, and then there's moments where it's right now. It's, it's, it's half of a heartbeat ago. It's something that stays with you. When I, when I think about that day, there's not one good memory. And I'm very uneasy in here. When I'm in here, when, when I'm in these four walls, all I'm left with is the failures. When I'm outside of this building, I can see all the good that came from it. This van you're looking at is the Denver SWAT team van. This is over on the east side of the school. I honestly think that we, we thought it wasn't going to happen. We hadn't been worldly and, and paying attention and, you know, school shootings had happened before this, but we thought these are just an anomaly and it's not going to happen here. This is a great community. Um, you know, we were very skilled at what we trained and what we could do, but we just weren't forward at thinking enough to think it's going to happen here. You know, you want to talk about being unprepared. I mean, we had a plan. We were prepared. It was just the wrong plan. We were prepared for the old barricade, right? We, this, we thought this was a SWAT dilemma. And so the protocol back then was what we called the four C's. Contain, control, contact, call SWAT. That's still the protocol today for a barricade. If you've got a guy in a house, you know, he's got a gun, he's fired a couple rounds, no one's in the house with him, it's the same protocol. And so that's the plan that we had. Like I said, it was the wrong plan. We were not forward thinking enough to say, wait a minute, by the time SWAT gets there, it's way too late. And it took this, um, it took column line for us to change our mind, to change the way that we viewed the world, for us to understand that we did not, uh, one, I don't think we understood the dilemma, and, and absolutely we, we didn't have the right tactics in place. You know, we sat there and, and looking at this, this failure, this was, this was a failure. This was a failure in, in forward thinking, in planning, in preparing. In my professional world, it was probably the most profound moment that I've been through, right? Um, it changed the way that you looked at your own profession. It changed the way that you looked at the media. It changed the way you looked at the legal system. It changed the way that you looked at community. It changed, uh, that day changed everything. After uh, Columbine, right here, kind of became the epicenter, um, is where the active shooter program started to roll out. And what that was, was training the patrolmen, giving them the skills, the equipment, to be able to go into the building and address the threat. And I'll tell you, that was met initially by resistance. When we first started teaching that, your, your patrolman that has been doing this job for a while, your patrol officer, I guess I should say, that have been doing this job for a while, they're like, that, I don't want, that's not our job, that's SWAT's job. You know, it is crazy now, you, you talk to a young police officer right now that gets out of the academy, they know that's their job. They know they're going to go to work, they're going to go inside, right? And maybe even by themselves. Uh, but back then, this was a whole way of changing. I mean, the, the whole thought process changed. But the bottom line is, you know, for the layman, the faster the cops are there and in the building addressing the threat, the suspect can't continue to kill, right? I mean, it's just simple. It started to force communication between the school districts and law enforcement. And it started to force some of those conversations, and I think it forced us to develop better relationships with the school. So schools did start to develop their own emergency plans and their own protocols, but there was no standardization about it. I mean, you could go within Jefferson County School District from 
high school to high school, and each principal would have things just a little bit different. You know, and, and on a critical day, that that's, can make things difficult, right? But, but Columbine started that conversation. Columbine started that conversation. Right, September 26, 2006, get the call. It was almost the exact same call from dispatch that I got at Columbine. You know, man with a gun, shot fired. Instead of saying Columbine, they're saying it's, it's Platte Canyon. It was almost the exact same verbiage. Law enforcement was much more prepared because they understood the dilemma better, right? Because they had studied, they had learned, they'd been trained, they, they trained hard. They had relationships with the schools that allowed them to get in and do some of those things and train. And if nothing else, walk through the school. So the first time you go into it, it's not on a critical day. And you've got a brave Park County deputy deploying by himself into that building. He knew the layout. He wasn't bogged down by trying to figure out where is this particular room. And that deputy, without hesitation, goes down that main hallway, breaks into that pod, and has that confrontation with the suspect right there at the entrance of room 206. And in my opinion, without a doubt, saved lives. He made that dilemma smaller, which allowed us then, when we came up, um, to not have to worry about, you know, Platte Canyon is about 80,000 square foot. We're just worried about 28 feet by 25 foot one room. And that was all from the courage of that deputy getting inside that building. And those are lessons learned from Columbine. The uh, suspect um, shot one of the hostages and then shot himself. That's what it looks like at this time. We had a really good plan. The thing that sometimes I think we don't take into account is the suspect always has a say in how this thing is going to go. And in my mind, um, that day was a failure. Because we lost him. There's no one that could, will ever be able to convince me that that was a success. December 9th, 2007, um, Youth with a Mission, which was a missionary school, and it was a dormant, but this is a more of a college age um, group, right? It's not a, not a high school. A um, little bit after midnight, a uh, gunman goes in there, he begins to shoot it. It's an active shooting event. There wasn't a lot of conversation at that point between law enforcement and, and fire service to get the fire service into an unsecured scene. Really, the protocol still was they, were gonna, they weren't going to come in until law enforcement could say that the scene was secure. All right, no, no harm on them. It's just that's where we were. Right after Platte Canyon, we were having that conversation, and we began to, to train with a, a private paramedic group that we had in our city that was providing our paramedic service. And we began to train and have the conversation to just tell them, hey, if you can just get the ambulances to the building, if we can give you protection, if you can get the ambulances to the building, we'll take the victims to you. So that doesn't mean you don't have a contact team doing some work still looking for a bad guy in the building, right? But really, there's no more shots being fired, so the focus of energy becomes those that have a chance to live. That if we can get our hands on them, if we can get them out of the building and to an emergency center, they've got a better chance of living. And really, the first example of that was YWAM. Within 10 minutes of the first 911 call, the four victims that were shot were loaded up in an ambulance, unsecure area, unknown where the suspect was, but under police protection, those ambulances came in, and they were on their way to the emergency room. Now, unfortunately, that night, um, both Tiffany and Philip succumbed to their injuries in the operating room. Um, but we gave them the best chance to survive. We learn, right? So that all the lives that have been lost in these senseless killings aren't in vain because we've learned and we've made changes and we're taking responsibility for what our part is. And that's the message. That training from Columbine has saved lives everywhere across this country and across Canada and even, even in Europe, without a doubt. I've trained in every state in the nation. I've trained in almost every province in um, Canada. I've been to Europe multiple times um, to teach and train. It's because of those bad days and the, I think the willingness to 
learn from those things that allows me and, and other people, not just me, but me to travel the country and, and train. This is a societal issue. How do we empower our society to take responsibility for themselves, to give them life-saving strategies so that if this thing kicks off, if it happens, if it is your given day, you know what to do. Those conversations are being had in the schools, right? They're being had in the schools. We're empowering children to make decisions. Those children that have gone through the educational system have now come into the workplace. And it's an interesting conversation because they go to their HR and they're like, what's our active shooter plan? And again, my generation, we, didn't talk, we don't talk about this. This is taboo. That generation talks about it. And it's forcing us now, again, to look and say, okay, now we're talking about the workplace. We're talking about everyday life. People want to be able to survive, right? And so we talk about evacuate, evade, defend. The conversation, empowering people to understand the best thing to do if it's happening, get away. If you can't get away, evade to a point where you can barricade or evade so that you just can't become a target. And moment in time, if your life is on the line, defend yourself or those that are next to you. And so we start having these conversations and now people are empowered. People understand, hey, I've got options. Las Vegas happens. Let's just throw that out there first. Las Vegas happens. One of the individuals that we trained is there hears the gunfire and knows what to do because they were empowered, right? And I get an email, AJ, I heard your voice. I knew what to do. Thank you, right? My friends, my family, we're good. Another active shooting that takes place closer to home. I get an email, AJ, I knew what to do. Because why? Because we had the conversation. So now let's go to California. It's a dark, it's November, Thousand Oaks, right? Um, I'm laying in bed. On my phone, I get a text. And as I look at it, it's my daughter, my oldest daughter. She, is, uh, she was working out at UCLA. You know, I didn't know this. I mean, you know, she's a grown woman. She, she's working out at UCLA. She went to the bar that night. And as I look at that text, it says, I love you guys. Now that is the same text that Emily sent her father. And of course my daughters know all that. You know, they know the keys, they know. My daughters help me train, all right? They understand. And for me, that's a trigger. I'm like, what, what is going on here? And she's dad, I'm in, I'm in the bar. There's gunfire. I've made it to the attic where I'm barricaded, but there's still a lot of gunfire. And, uh, you know, you talk about the events that I've been involved in. When you're there as a first responder and you're making decisions and you're, you're kind of in control, not all the time, but you're, you're focused doing your job. That night, it was the most hopeless I've ever felt in my life, right? Helpless, I guess. I mean, there were, I was paralyzed. So I'm on the phone with Ventura County Dispatch. I'm telling them, hey, my daughter's texting me. She's uh, in, the, in the attic. I had pulled up the 911 app, and thankfully Ventura County's uh, dispatch was not um, encrypted, so I could hear the radio traffic, right? So I'm listening to the radio traffic. I'm texting her. I'm talking to them. I'm sharing the text that she's giving me to their dispatch, and, of course, I'm booking a flight to Los Angeles on my iPad. And... We text, um, and I could hear the radio traffic. I kind of had an idea of what was going on, and you know, she says there's no more gunfire. Um, and finally, she's like, "Dad, I can see SWAT." Right. And the Ventura County SWAT team pulled her out of there. They handed her off to Oxnard PD, and I was on my way to DIA. I got a text from a buddy of mine in Montana. 
and a guy that I trained. And he goes, you know, AJ, you don't want to hear this right now. Well, your daughter's alive because of what you've done, because of the training that you've done to law enforcement, to fire, to EMS, to civilians. And I don't know if I can say that, right? But it still came full circle. But it came full circle. It came full circle. And my daughter's alive because she was empowered. She was empowered because we had the conversation, because we didn't make this some taboo, crazy thing. We understand that we're going to be real about this, that this could happen. And if it does, it's our responsibility, right? And she did what she needed to do to survive. Because there's no doubt in my mind, had she panicked, had she had not formulated a plan, um, I don't believe she'd be here.